Um, good evening. My name is Koruna Nandi, and I am going to talk about something which might sound a little bit cheesy, but I hope to demonstrate that it is in fact true. Um, you know, when I was eight years old, my aspiration was to um, grow up to work in, as a middle-level executive in a company and wear a pink suit and go to work. Now, this is something that was quite different from where my parents came from. My father uh, had returned from a job in the Harvard Medical School Hospital to work in Ames because it was the hospital that offered the best public service to the most poor people. My mother had received uh, the History Prize at the LSE and gave up her career in academics to um, set up the first organization for disabled children in North India. My father earned, I was born though in a small house in Delhi where my father earned about 900 rupees a month and my mother earned a little bit less. Maybe hence the aspiration for the, for the pink suit. Um, living and learning though, testing and reinvention. And I found that maybe somewhere that they had a point. I found that there is a deep happiness to be had in engaging in meaningful work. Uh, work that creates a tide that lifts not just one's own boat, but that lifts the boats of others. While also engaging in work, of course, that allows the more basic pleasures of perhaps air conditioning, you know, and the occasional foreign holiday. But also good health care and education in the absence of public provision as we have in this country. Now, through my journey, as I was studying my first degree is in economics from St. Stephen's, and while studying microeconomics and the neoclassical economics that we've almost exclusively then taught, one thing I realized is that what these models were missing was the joy that one gets from altruism. Now, this is something that has been addressed outside of the curricula that we were given in Delhi University at the time by welfare economics. Um, <clears throat> also, there are psychological assessments of the value of altruism, for instance, in the 2014, there's a study in the Journal of Positive Psychology that shows that lawyers, and this is, this is now my profession, um, that engage in work that supports those who are less fortunate in life, that brings about justice, work that brings about justice, are happier, they're less likely to be alcoholics. We are, in fact, built for empathy. Much of our media and our political leaders emphasize and stoke the differences between us. Um, quite literally though, we are wired to connect with each other. There, are, there is research that has found mirror neurons um, in the last four or five years. So for example, you will find that if you see a baby smiling, one's impulse is to smile back. If you see someone suffering, there is a mirror neuron that fires in your brain that makes you suffer to some extent in return. Of course, we also have protective defense mechanisms that quash these feelings. But absent those, our natural impulse is to be empathetic. We are also, in fact, made up of the same atoms, all of us. We're made up of the same basic, uh, 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 basic um, material. Ideas and memes we also know that are positive have a greater tendency to go viral than negative ideas. Now, if you've been on Twitter, if you've been on the internet, you know, you may think that because of the trolling, because of the negativity that we see around, that this is not the case. But in fact, if you look at all the, if you look at the, the issue systematically, you find that there are two things that cause an idea or meme to go viral. One is if it arouses strong emotion and two, if it is positive. Now, this is us as, as an individual level. Where have we come as a people? As a people, we have traveled fairly well together so far, in fact. The arc of history is long, but it has, in fact, bent towards the greater good. Poverty has reduced dramatically. Many more people are living under democratic regimes than ever before. Deaths in war and international conflict has reduced. There is an increase in literacy the world over. 
more women in parliament globally, and there, are more, there is more internet access than ever before. So yes, we are more connected than ever before, but of course we know that the picture, the global picture is not all rosy. There are challenges that we face um, that are moving fast. Climate change, for instance. NASA measured <clears throat> that February 2016 had a dramatic and ongoing surge in the planet's temperature that is in fact unprecedented. We worry about religious supremacy with ISIS globally, and even in our country, there are concerns about Hindu supremacy, there are concerns about male supremacy, there are concerns about caste supremacy. Um, and women die of violence, of whether it's domestic or outside, even by the end of the speech, a number of women globally will have died. So yes, we are more connected than ever before. But what does this mean? That we have the power to shape our world in a way that is unprecedented. A major basis for that, I think, is making sure that A, people have the tools to make this difference, and B, that people also have the ability to speak truth to power. Because if we only have one idea that dominates the discourse, then not only do we lose out on power being equally distributed, but we lose out on a wealth of ideas and a wealth of inspiration and a wealth of contribution that the world, the country, this audience can bring to the table. This time last year, some of us were arguing for a free internet before the Supreme Court. The legal position then was that Section 66A of the Internet Technology Act of 2000 required that the police arrest anyone who said something online that was at the least uh, lowest threshold, annoying or inconvenient. So what was annoying or inconvenient was not in fact defined anywhere. So the local constable in any part of the country could in fact decide whether the speech was sufficiently annoying or inconvenient to allow him and require him, in fact, to arrest you. Now, as we know, the arrests under that provision were, 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 were somewhat arbitrary. There was a young woman called Shaheen Dhada who said about Bal Thakre that Bombay shut down out of fear and out of, not out of respect on her Facebook, Facebook page, and only one person liked it, her school friend, Rino Srinivasan. Both the girls were arrested, even though some goons had come and uh, broken down her uncle's hospital. The goons at the initial um, uh, stages were not arrested. The girls were, in fact, arrested. So this is the problem with the law. Um, <clears throat> another problem was that intermediaries, whether it's Facebook or Twitter, or and intermediaries, let us remember, was very, very loosely defined. So if you have an individual web page and you know, there are people posting comments on it, then you, a, a blogspot page for instance, or a WordPress page, then you too could be seen as an intermediary. And intermediaries would lose their safe harbor, their protection from liability, their protection as a neutral platform. If they failed to take down content, that was at a pretty low, blasphemous, not defined anywhere, um, and, uh, at otherwise low standards. So intermediaries were in fact incentivized to take down all sorts of content. The other problem was that website blocking was being undertaken by the government secretly because rules had been made. No reasons were being given for why a website was blocked. We saw there, therefore in uh, the beginning of last year that GitHub was blocked, people's businesses were shut down, the people were creating collaborative businesses across the world, those were shut down. Vimeo was shut down, filmmakers were no longer able to access or display their work. This was all done in an extremely arbitrary manner, about 32 websites were shut down and nobody knew why. Fortunately, the Supreme Court found fit to find in our favor and laid down what is one of the most important judgments in free speech. After approximately 50 years, a criminal provision of free speech was struck down for the first time. 
What is the position now? The Supreme Court has made extremely clear that discussion and advocacy is allowed. Whether you are discussing violence, even if you, according to me, are advocating for violence, unless you are inciting violence, this is something that is sufficient. I speak of this in these times because I do think that speech is something that enables truth, as I said, to be spoken to power, that enables innovation to happen, that allows the inspirations that we collectively bring together to create a world that is good, to create a world that is better, to allow the contagion of goodness to spread without barrier, and that without barrier, that is extremely important. Our Constitution, in fact, requires that reasonable restrictions be placed on free speech. But how has our Supreme Court and the world over, if you look at the Brandenburg judgment in the United States, if you look at the progressive judgments from the European Court of Human Rights, the standard that we agree on is incitement to violence and a certain standard of hate speech. The idea of nation, I think, is an idea that belongs to all of us. The idea of the anti-national is something that can be persuasive, but it is nowhere found in the law. We all contribute to what this nation becomes. We all contribute to the reduction of, we all must contribute, and I think in various ways we do contribute, even if it's just through our taxes, to equality, to the reduction of poverty, to the spread of gender equality. In my experience, I find that in the Bhopal cases, for instance, um, the Bhopal cases, and I will take a few seconds to talk about that to set the context. A lot of people know about the gas tragedy in 1984. However, the same people have been drinking water that is affected by the toxic waste that was dumped on the site, and neurotoxins and hexachlorocyclohexanes seeped into the ground. The same people had were being tested in the hospital that was built, uh, built for them for drugs that were meant for richer people, sometimes without informed consent. There were times that people would die and these incidents were never reported. Free speech here was extremely important because here, to bring these issues to light, to bring the issues of some of the poorest, most disadvantaged people in the world in the face of corporate and government, and I'm not just talking about the Indian government, I'm also talking about the government of the United States, um, Nexus and various parties, mind you. In the face of this, it is a free media, the ability to speak freely, that is extremely important and to some extent made a change. In 2010, there was a judgment that came out in the lower court, giving only a two-year penalty against the people who were responsible for the disaster in India, a two-year criminal penalty. This is under Section 304A. It's the same provision that is used in traffic accidents. There was a huge national outcry. Free speech again. People extremely upset. There were protests, there were media protests, and the government at the time, the government brought a curative petition before the Supreme Court asking for the unfair settlement to be reopened. We joined, the survivors groups joined, five of us, and um, uh, we had a separate, cure, uh, separate claim asking for $8 billion. Um, but without this national outcry, it is possible that the government would not have done what it did. If you think, for instance, in terms of gender equality, if we only had the dominant patriarchal narrative exist, if we only had dominant caste narratives, if we only had dominant religious narratives, could really gender equality begin to flourish the way it did in 2012 and after? The right to free expression includes also the right to information. Let us be clear about that. And I know that some of you here have uh, VPN lines. And that is the way, actually, that a lot of people the world over are bypassing national boundaries on the internet. It is through these debates and critiques and negotiations that political truths are reached. 
order cannot be secured just by fear of infraction. It is hazardous, in fact, to suppress and to make fearful a population because this, I think, is what leads ultimately to violence. The path to order, I think, is through negotiations of idea of nation, through negotiations of your idea and my idea and their idea. These are not easy negotiations, but this is the task, I think, that we must be engaged in. I believe that it is in discussing our ideas of the kind of utopia that we have failed to reach in our more than six decades of independence that will perhaps move us towards it. Once we imagine it in its technicolored splendor, as the many splendor thing that it is, I think this is something that will take us all across disciplines and geographies and languages to achieve it in some significant measure. This is what I believe is our work. And this is what I believe in both a collective and a personal level will bring us a deep and a true joy. Thank you.